Hey, welcome everyone to the Archicad User Monthly Webinar. Uh, today is March 26th, I think, 2020, in the midst of COVID-19. Um, so uh, I wanted to uh, welcome all of you to this opportunity to gather uh, Archicad users virtually, um, since we're seeing each other so much less in person. And I want to give a special welcome, of course, to Leslie Pink Morgan. So Leslie, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. So uh, Leslie will be our uh, guest presenter. I'll be interviewing her and she'll be showing a bunch of her work. Uh, let me make sure that you all can hear and see my screen. Um, and uh, let's see, we have like 89 people right now. It's going up. Um, let me go to the questions here. So uh, please uh, just type into the GoToWebinar questions. Uh, tell us hello and where you're calling in from. And maybe a comment about your experience here and, you know, with COVID-19 and, and how you're coping with it. Um, so I see uh, Ramrick, um, Bill from Kansas City, Tom from Vancouver, Dwight, uh, Terrence. Richard from Bermuda, Romrick is from Trinidad and Tobago. So we have a couple from the islands down there and then John Dunham from up in Salt Spring Island, we're other different island up in off of uh, British Columbia, I believe, or Washington, state of Washington, I always forget. Glenn, Nicole, okay. So we have a lot of people. Thank you for, for saying hello. And I guess you must be able to hear me if you're typing that in. So let's switch focus. I'm going to um, make you presenter, Leslie, so you can um, show your screen. Um, okay. And Leslie, unfortunately, doesn't have a webcam. Uh, so um, let me just see, uh, make you presenter there. Okay, so you're going to go ahead and share your screen. Okay, so there I am. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Um, I, yeah, I just pulled up a photo from our, our uh, staff website. So this is our small crew at Eisman Design. And um, I guess I'll just kind of go through um, a brief intro about, um, I guess I'm assuming you all read about me, so I won't necessarily go over that again. But um, I was going to just start off by talking about how we use ArchiCAD. Um, and I'm going to pull from a previous uh, presentation that I did for um, AIA and Arc Vista. So before you go on, you um, um, yeah, just, just the quick part of what you shared. You started with ArchiCAD back in like 2011 or 12 in like ArchiCAD 14, was it something? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and the firm's been going uh, with ArchiCAD since ArchiCAD 6. I do remember working with Bill when he uh, first got it set up. Um, and when I was a reseller uh, and, you know, selling ArchiCAD and training people, you know, Bill was one of the people that I helped get going. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was kind of where this, this presentation starts as well. So to kind of recap on that, um, yeah, our owner has been using ArchiCAD 6, I think, since he went to Cal Poly um, and had been using it his whole whole career. Um, our office started out, um, he would design in ArchiCAD, we would do design development in SketchUp, because um, that's what another employee knew how to do modeling in, and then I was very familiar with Autodesk, so that's where our construction documents were taking place until 2011-2012, we made the switch <laughs> to ArchiCAD only. Um, and it's really, it's really been a game changer for our office and for the efficiency and improved skill level and um, all of those things. So I'll kind of just quickly run through this these um, AIA intro slides to show um, a little bit about our process. And then we can um, jump into some of these other models and topics. Does that sound good? That is okay. good. I, I was muted, so I had to turn that back on. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so back 
um, our owner, Bill, he would typically kind of hand sketch, um, we do bubble diagrams or hand sketched floor plans for our initial schematics. Some of that has changed now with um, graphic overrides and things that ARCHICAD will allow us to, um, to do, which has been really helpful. Um, so we can do a little bit more of it in ARCHICAD without having to do much hand drawing, but it will depend on the client and the project what the deliverable is. So we'll start out with usually a, a floor plan site plan that's hand drawn um, for our first meeting with our clients. And then, um, then we'll kind of move it into a little bit more hard line as we start with um, massing. So I think I'm kind of this, I'm kind of running through a, um, some phases of projects. So we'll, you know, like I said, doing our floor planning, getting into massing, uh, which we'll do some, this was generated right out of ARCHICAD uh, 3D sketch renders or whatever to help us work through. And then we kind of transition it in Photoshop with some shading and foliage. Um, this is a project too that I'll be showing the model of later. So that's kind of helpful. So just taking this like straight out of ARCHICAD into Photoshop, we get something a little bit more um, pleasant to look at and easier to read. Mm. And this, so, and then this would be like a representation of the, you know, flat elevations that are created within the ARCHICAD modeling. Um, we would utilize those by taking, um, taking those into to Photoshop and running like a sketch filter or a spatter filter and then adding 2D graphics. I know these aren't, these, it's kind of, this project is from 2014 and we've improved our skills since then, but you kind of get the idea of how we're utilizing the 2D work, 3D and 2D work out of ARCHICAD into like presentation type stuff. This is a, a planning package um, so that kind of run through to show site plan, floor plan, these elevations in a little bit more finished format um, for a planning package for this project, utilizing sections, um, color renderings. Um, so again, we'd render some stuff out of, out of ARCHICAD and then usually do some Photoshop on top of it. Uh, in my AIA presentation, we kind of ran through a BIMX model, but we'll get into some other things as we move forward. Um, another way that we use ARCHICAD in the office is kind of to, um, this particular client, client was super involved with wanting like changes throughout the process. So we were looking at different wall finishes for this fireplace element inside the model. So I was able to do some quick kind of raw images for them to review and look at. Um, so that was a helpful um, tool for that ARCHICAD obviously has the ability you can make any material and any finish out of a JPEG to show yeah, love, different love, tile options. I love showing it in context. And then the, perhaps it's a manufacturer image, uh, um, you know, the material and, and you've, been able to take these manufacturer images and create a texture specifically from them. Yes. So this, yeah, for this project, it was super helpful um, for the homeowner to see what was what was happening. Um, here's just kind of an aerial view of the model. They're right on the bluff, so this is representative of the ocean. Um, so that we can see that out the window. And then here's the back of the house that looks towards the ocean. Um, and then again, like I said, since we're able to do schematic design, design development and construction documents all in one, this is kind of a quick overview of what our some pieces of construction documents would look like. Everything with a automatically generated base and then we do some 2D over, overlay, but um, great program. And then I'll come back to show these photos uh, later when we get into this is my sample project too. So, um, but it's really nice to be able to kind of see where the model came from and then how it, how it transitions. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Okay. 
Okay, are you ready to jump into the um, kind of the list of our start with our French style? Yeah, um, um, let's just. Or do you want to? So you, uh, I guess you mentioned that you, in your other presentation that you'd done a while back, uh, that you showed BIMX, uh, and you're now doing some different visualization options. So now you're um, using things like Twin Motion and Lumion. Is that right? That is correct. We are still utilizing the integrated um, BIMX feature. We, as a as a deliverable in our office, we for design development, we produce a 3D virtual model of almost every project. For sure, all the custom homes. Um, maybe not always all of the remodels, but we'll just talk about the custom homes for now. Um, that we present to the client and that we also usually give them an executable file to allow them to walk through the finished product, kind of like a video game, mm -hmm. and really let them absorb uh, the space and the heights and the volumes and the finishes. And it, it's an amazing tool that helps them really like see it because so many people are unable to visualize 2D graphics in a 3D um, aspect. So we're able to um, sometimes that gives them an idea as far as finishes go with wood finish or paint grade or carpet or tile or whatever um, it allows us to change those materials once they see it in the model we'll make a recommendation and then they'll say oh i love that or oh can i see what that looks like with mm -hmm. um, with a wood floor instead so we're able to make those changes um, in the model before they get into construction where those changes can be really expensive. Right. Now, when I was looking at this for a second, I just uh, was thinking of it differently and I was going, wow, it's very realistic vegetation. Um, and, uh, <laughs> this is a it? photo. <laughs> yeah. Now, how did you get an aerial view? Did you use a drone or is the across the street, is there some, um, you know, higher elevation? We we did um, the photographer uh, yes had a drone so that was great because we were able to especially for the um, the rear view of this that um, is out over the ocean so <laughs> the drone came yeah. was uh, super helpful so here's kind of the back of that and I mean it's just just popping back um, to look at the rear view from the model. Um, mm -hmm you know what that what that looks like so you can see those elements have come to life um much more gracefully obviously in the photo but yeah, yeah it's, um, it's interesting it, it used to be that to get a, a photo you know from an angle like that uh was you know impractical uh but yeah uh, <laughs> okay yeah let's let's take a look at your archicad projects um so i'll just give a preamble uh, so Leslie um, uh, shared the uh, projects with me as part of the 2020 training course that, you know, I've mentioned. Um, uh, when I sent out a call saying, hey, I'd like to demonstrate and examine and, and uh, show how different roof structures are built. <clears throat> In other words, um, I, I could synthesize or try to create certain things, but th there's much more interesting work out there in context and so leslie shared three different projects which we'll be looking at today and what i was struck by them is that they were each quite distinct vernacular different styles um, the roofs were one certainly one part of it but not you know if you look at it architecturally or archicad wise it's um it's only one part uh but uh you know leslie shared these and i've been actually going through some of the technical details of you know how do you do a roof that breaks like this or how do you uh, get a, sw a swept um, form and you know the various technical things so let's uh, take a look at it from both an archicad perspective and a little bit from the design side you know what what are the considerations that you know you went through to create this this is a french style is that right yeah, that's kind of what I was calling it. Um, it's interesting because this particular client, um, I believe they were from Texas and many of the homes are like all stone. So this is all stone. And 
um, and very large and massive. And that's what, you know, it's cheap to build in, in Texas, not as cheap to build in California, but that's where some of their design inspiration was coming from. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, yeah, I wasn't quite sure exactly what to call it, but I feel like it's kind of French uh, with the steep roof and the curved um, eave. And again, some of these barrel vaults. So that was what um, I think you and I originally spoke on was um, you're interested about dormers and, you know, the barrel vault or the barrel roofs, curved roofs, um, complex profiles and um, some of that. So this house kind of came to mind because it had the dormer with the curved roof. Um, this was not a project that I personally worked on in our office, but um, it's under construction right now. And um, I have a few construction photos to share with you of these details um, so you can see what how they've kind of come, come out um, mm -hmm. in the wash. But we've yes. used the dorm. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just, yeah, so with these things, I think, without going into as much detail as we would in a training class or whatever, just select things like the dormer roof and just let's talk about what tool you're using, you know, for this. And I mean, even open up mm -hmm. the setting briefly. Um, sure, that will work. I, I was going to say we have used the dormer um, object before, but I think we typically find that um, we end up needing a little bit more uh, flexibility and manipulating it so we end up just using a typical like wall and um, and trimming it with this roof or the ceiling inside or or um, or whatever I believe this is just a basic shell object um, would you like me to open the just open it briefly so that people can see that it's an object rather than a an actual roof so it's in the sure basic shapes the basic fully. shape yeah i um i utilize these basic shapes quite a bit um when i'm designing custom furniture or fixtures or pieces because they're integrated in the library and don't um don't have a lot of extra polylines and things to slow your model down so i try to use the basic shapes whenever i can mm -hmm. Um, and we just did like a surface override uh, for the material um, for that particular instance. We do try to use the composite walls and roofs uh, whenever possible, but obviously things things come up where you have to just override. <laughs> um, okay, and then I guess moving on to these other kind of the the illusion of a curved roof. This is simply just two different roof objects um, at different pitch, like a pitch break, essentially, right there at the eave overhang um, to kind of give that look of the curved, curved roof that's common in a French, kind of French style. Um, and, and I believe okay. these are just, go ahead. Yeah, and then the, uh, the, the little, um, I guess, bay window with the sort of curved Oh yes, this piece, um, these are also, let's see, um, a shell, a shell type, um, at, you know, different angles that have filleted together to make that kind of cleaned up around there. And it just also has a, a surface override of the illusion of like a standing seam or metal, metal roof. Uh, let's see, what else did we talk about? I believe we talked about this um, cool looking wall. So there's the, we use um, a regular wall composite here. And then this was a complex, I'm going to say a complex wall profile that was generated to give all of these layers. So, so you can kind of see that. Then you just did a cutout for the for the windows. The windows are inserted in the back, the main wall. Right. I was just going to touch on that. Um, this this wall back here, that's the main kind of structure, would have the actual window uh, object placed in it. And this one out here, you can kind of see these extra dots have um, just like a window opening 
and we would typically label those Z and turn them off so they don't show up in the window schedule, but it allows it to like do the cut, um, cut open for the window in this other wall without making it too complicated. And then I believe this is just the, the sill is connected to the window object is just very deep, you can change in the settings there. Um, we've got some rafters on the flat, corbels or whatever you want to call them. Um, the, this is another place where we use the um, solid, I think we typically use solid element operation, but we've also been um, using just the composite profile itself, which I've shown to be easier. When you're doing um, this type of exposed tail, when it's on the flat like this, um, it's very easy to just create um, the complex profile. So if you right click on it instead, um, uh, and then you can say open, or edit selected composite slash profile, about halfway down. Um, okay, very good. Okay, then, so yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to show where, We'll go ahead and like create this in here and then apply it to a beam and then you don't have to do the solid element operation so it makes it kind of one less step and one less object to um, worry about adjusting or making sure that it's lining up we do have to do solid element operation when they're on the rake or on the angle for exposed rafter tails but for these flat ones we like to just use the the complex profile and apply it to the beam directly. So it's really so um, just as a technical note, uh, the profile you saw, of course, the the decorative shape, and that is the shape that is now the beam that she's doing mm -hmm. is only a few inches deep. So in other words, the beam is not going from the edge of the roof or the um, overhang back to the building. The beam is going from left to right the short this. direction true yes yeah, yeah this is the length of your beam versus versus so anyway, you, can, you can certainly use the same thing in, on a slope there's absolutely nothing to prevent you from having uh that you just would have a different version for each angle so in other words if you had two different right. roof angles with a similar rafter tail or, or or you know detail like that you would create two different versions of the um of that beam uh profile um the so. only i think for our um we usually use the roof wizard for exposed mm -hmm. tails and so um we're usually just cutting away from that but as mm -hmm. opposed to having just the little piece show that that's right. definitely true yeah you can change right change this to something on the angle right okay um, I think the other, this was one of the other kind of interested items that we talked about, just kind of surface um, beams, you know, that were just changed to be very thin and put over over uh, the brick. Um, Eric, was there anything else that you remember on this uh, particular from, model? The question from David Proctor saying, I'd like to see how you choose to display the construction plan around the dormers. Okay, say that one more time. How we display the construction? Uh, the construction, the construction plan around the dormers. So, what are what do you, you know, what do people see on the plan? And I guess what do they see in a section? Um, I know you in the sections in this model, which you didn't do. Uh, it's pretty diagrammatic, and then you have details that that go into more deep. Uh, you know. Yeah. Let me see if we've got a section through there. But look on the plan as well. I mean, that would be, uh, I think he's talking about the construction plan. So. Sure. Um, all right. Let me look at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Apologize because this is not my project. Uh, let's see. Roof plan. Let's see what our roof plan shows. Um, so he was asking specifically about the cut plane setting. So um, uh, are you doing anything special in terms of defining a, a custom cut plane? Um, probably, 
probably not. I'm imagining, let's see if I go back to here, that this wall, because this is a single story house, these walls would be on um, story two and we would have, yeah, they're on the second floor. So we would just allow the, um, the roof, I'm sorry, roof plan. Um, we would just allow these second story walls to show on the roof plan and make sure that the roof was not opaque. Um, and then that, that would allow us, you know, where the window tag would show here. So we, we do it a few different ways when we have, um, sometimes when we have clear story plans, we'll, we might do like a clear story plan, like second floor plan with just the clear story and then the roof to be able to dimension uh, the location of the windows and make sure that those tags are showing in plan. Mm -hmm. When it's just like this, for example, where it's a single story and there's these kind of one-off dormers, we've been probably consistently showing these on the roof plan like like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a question. How is the slope calculated on the roof? I mean, you, I know you would know it that it's 10 and 12, but the annotation that says slope 10 and 12 um, uh, is that something that's automatic or just simply uh, an annotation? Um, we we type it in. Um, we use this is um, this is actually a label label tool mm -hmm. that um, and we're able to. We've actually copied this from older versions that have allowed us. Here's the settings. Um, mm -hmm. But we've been able to slide the text over so if it's lined up in the middle we can move it kind of over the arrow so that it looks like this and that it's one object versus an arrow and separate text needing to be grouped interesting um, but we just yeah we just type this in um right. you know after clicking on our roof to find out what it is and just type that in right yeah. okay great um let's see so another question let's see uh how do you address the inset windows and waterproofing details? <laughs> um, we have kind of generic uh, window details. Um, so that's always a good question. Our contractors love, love our generic details. Let's see what we have. They kind of work through that. Um, we'll call out uh, maybe a you know percent slope on the sill or something. Um, let me see if we have anything specific on that. Um, this is the door. Where's the window? Window details. So we kind of have some generic, you know, things sloped required for drainage. So it's not super <clears throat> specific um, because most contractors do what they want to do. And so us putting these in is more for us. Uh, CYA or permitting, um, and then they they do what they're supposed to do per the manufacturer because we don't always know the exact window manufacturer that's going to be selected. Um, so they're kind of generic from that aspect. Right. Okay. Great. Um, let's see. <clears throat> um, we want to go on to net, uh, more, you know, some of the other projects before too long. Yeah. Could you describe the process you use for the key plan? That's an interesting. Um, question. Where were they looking at that? On the roof? Well, I don't know. Pedro Navarro says, could she describe the process for the key plan, please? Um, okay, let me see. If you have on, maybe on, on, on your sh layout sheet. Oh, this, you, right there here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we utilize the, the key plan. I, I mean, again, I do. Let's see if, let's see if this is in here. <laughs> Um, sometimes for the site, I think I'm not exactly sure where, um, sorry, I'll go back to this, this just from clicking on it, this is That's on the just sheet. It's just a fill. Yeah, it's just a fill on the sheet, <clears throat> but, um, we do use the key plan for our attic calc and, um, maybe because this roof is a little bit complicated, they just took this. 
uh, fill from the view and then reduced it here on the sheet. Um, I do use this um, this key plan view often and we'll just adjust the um, scale to get it down small and turn off pretty much everything except maybe just the roofs and put a fill over it uh, to give the areas for our attic ventilation calc. This one only has one attic, but typically there's there's usually like two or three areas. Um, so yeah. that's, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question, but. I think so. I mean, let me just elaborate just for a moment. So you can have a live key plan from a particular view of, you know, particularly a story <clears throat> like the ground floor, um, reduced down to a very tiny scale and with only the walls, you know, and, and with doors and windows turned off or <clears throat> things like that, um, that's one uh, option. Another is to simply create what you need for, um, you know, for, for this and using a fill, I mean, you could potentially have a fill <clears throat> that was on the literal plan, just on a layer that was only used for the key plan. And then you can, of course, coordinate that fill to match your exact footprint. So if the building changes a bit, you know, you're coordinating it in the live view but only showing perhaps one layer, um, you know, on the key plan. And, and you might, in some cases, key plans might have so the where the elevations are being com coming from or sections, um, you know. So it depends, of course, what what drawing you're looking at. Um, so let's um, let's move on. Let me show you. Okay. Yeah, I was going to just show you the quick. Um, I had I had three photos of of this house. So you could see kind of, um, let's see if I can, um, can get these in similar areas. So this is the kind of this view. Um, you can see the similar uh, swoop roof and how the, um, the eaves were working and the windows mm -hmm. there. Um, this is. Uh, where's that other one? Similar, let's see, I think there's one. There's one more. Looks like they haven't quite finished up that, sorry, up that detail yet, but that it's the, um, this extra kind of banding here with the two layers of stone. It doesn't look quite as thick and luscious in real life as it does in the model they may have, um, value engineered that to be a little bit thinner. Hmm. But anyway, it's nice to see, you can see the the exposed tails and kind of how this, oh, sorry, how this whole project's coming together. So that's kind of, kind of fun. Right, right, excellent. Okay. okay. So we have uh, two more projects plus some rendering okay. things that we're gonna look at. So let's- Yeah. Look. Let's, yeah, let's blaze through because I did end up pulling up a twin motion and a movie to share. Um, so the next project is the contemporary, the contemporary one. Um, this one that we've kind of looked at already in, in the, um, sorry in the arc in the AIA presentation. Um, this is in version 18, so I can't like, I don't have all the tabs um, organized as, as well, but at least we can kind of talk about, um, you know, the, we, this one was flat roofs, parapet caps, skylights, um, some angled, angled windows and a lot of there's a lot of custom furniture in this in this project um if we and i some of it was reused in the last project too so we can or in my sample project three so we can gloss over that that po component of it but um so i guess just to start with the flat roofs um we did actually use um I think partially this was my um, inexperience when, when I was starting, but um, I used slabs and roofs um, as we were trying to kind of figure out how this was gonna be constructed. 
um, the skylight object obviously needs a roof to be able to to puncture through um, on its own. So I actually ended up, if I was doing this again, I would do the whole thing in a roof, but just so you know what I actually did, um, this piece is roof and the rest of this is, is slab. Um, and I don't know if that was partially because of how I needed it to look on the underside or the thickness or whatever it was, but for some reason at the time, this was what I thought was the best best way to model it um, so we in you know use the skylight object inside the roof it automatically cuts the hole um, that's awesome um, and then we did end up working with um, a company to do surface or um, I guess like a finish root finish flat roof that was also the insulation and so those um, are turned off right now but those were modeled um, as actual roofs on the very like low slope to show um, how they would all fit around and how high the parapets needed to be. Um, that would be interesting to turn on if you if you are able to, or is that not in this model? Yeah, let me see. Um, roof insulation. Sure. Is it. And there is a question on, on layer organization. So at some point, it would be nice to oh. just see your layer dialog box. Um, I imagine you might have oh. it off on another screen because we didn't see that. Sure. Sure. Um, I'd probably be more interested to share that in, um, <laughs> in the last one because, again, this one is an older project and so it's a little okay. rough. But um, I mean, I, I'm happy to. Yeah. So now we're now we're seeing. Over. Yeah, now we're seeing the slope um, of these, and just as a, a as a side note, in in general, you know, you're if you're going to have a flat underside for a ceiling, and you're going to have a sloped top for a flat roof, um, mm -hmm. then you will need two elements: one with the slope, and one that's flat. Um, now they could be a slab with a roof on top. Or you could do two roofs. You know, the roof could be used for the ceiling part, but you right. will because you can't really have the bottom be one thing and the top be another one with a single element. Um, you know, you uh, you do need stacked elements. So what you did is right. is perfectly valid. You know, work through of you know multiple elements. Good. That probably um, yeah that jogs my memory a little. So that's that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is rigid okay, insulation. So, rigid insulation that's yeah. put on. Yeah. And it's actually a finished roof product with insulation um, as part of it. It's got like you do multiple layers and kind of build up. Um, so some areas would be as thick as like three layers, and it would slope down to one layer. But the average coverage would get the um, the R value that's required for our for our state. Um, so those were kind of um, modeled after we finalized the design with that consultant so that we could confirm that the parapets we had designed were tall enough to receive the height of those and that you wouldn't, they wouldn't be popping up over the top of the parapet. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm gonna turn those off for a moment and then um, I can kind of zoom into these the parapets here. I know um, Eric and I talked about that last time. And um, this parapet, not that. Mm -hmm. So there is a question, how was drainage handled? Um, so with those sloping insulation roofs, we had um, like similar to a deck drain. So we had drains in the corners and then the um, they were in wall. I can show you um, I can show you some the details of that because those those I do have. Um, okay, 
so um, we kind of, again, these are 2D details that we've kind of cribbed from project to project, but um, there'll be, you know, the, the two, the, the main drain and the backup drain against the parapet so that everything slopes. And then we've done like in wall drains so that everything's concealed and then out into the, you know, they tie it into the storm, storm drain or whatever. Um, and then this this one kind of also shows that little cap flashing on the on the parapet edge um, that we actually modeled here. So I just used a complex profile similar to the one we talked about for the um, the exposed tails, and I just applied it to to a beam, and then it you know it nicely joins itself together, but it it was at least able to to give a little bit of reveal and um, representation in the 2D graphics that there is some type of cap and finish on top of those parapet walls, which is what we were kind of trying to show. So it it would um, it would give a little shadow and a little whatever versus drawing just a 2D line on those elevations. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a question how that was modeled. Question about the corner window that you know how was that done? Um, just with the basic window, um, like a fixed a fixed window. Let me open up the um, thing. When you go in here, again, this is version 18, so it might look a little different now. Um, the custom corner, you can choose if you want a frame, a column, or glass. So it's just chosen as glass at the corner, the right corner, and then this other one is chosen glass at the left corner, and you're able to um, get that mitered that mitered look mm -hmm. and then with these angled windows we have one here in the front and let's go to the back because that one is really the coolest one i can get back there we've got all these all these models open so it's a little sluggish but um this one is right out of the dining room over this cool hot tub that has a direct kind of like infinity edge to the ocean um so we um just made um one separate wall so this wall has an opening in it sorry and then um inside that opening there's this other piece of um of wall that's even thicker with another opening and then another uh thinner wall that we were able to put on the angle so you can see here this is i know it's generic because we weren't all using composites yet um, at an 85 degree angle and then the window is inside that angled wall not the vertical wall so that's how we were able to get kind of the look of that which was really um it's a nice like dramatic view from from inside and i can show some photos of that um, is there any anything else like all this furniture out here was I just modeled it from basic basic shapes or slabs or whatever and it was just taken from like restoration hardware or something like that that the client um, had had determined uh, can you show a section through the model sure um, let me see I think this is good this is a good one um, Oh yeah, this one's in black background because I'm old school and I like black background. <laughs> um, this is just through the um, that great room where the the sliding door is. So here's where the skylights um, were cut through the roof component, but we weren't really showing this. Um, this insulation roof, but that kind of I just turned it off so you can see how the skylights automatically cut through um, and here's the tiny little so it's all, it's all grouped together the tiny little parapet cap that you can see is, a, is an actual beam um, modeled the insulation and the framing and um, and like this stuff is we do 2d graphics but we come back in after we get structural and we'll coordinate any of these large 
kind of structural beams and the ARCHICAD library is great for actually pulling in what structural says needs to go there. So we have the sizes and dimensions to make sure that it, um, it fits and we can coordinate, coordinate that. Um, yeah, we've improved these, some of these graphics as time goes on. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, it's great. I think uh, you want to move on to the next model soon. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, uh, I'll, um, I'll look, go ahead and show. Okay. Yeah, I want to, we'll want to look at, and maybe it's in this model or maybe in the last one, uh, your library of furniture. You were showing me some really um, extensive okay. collections that you've gotten, um, as well as your uh, textures for use on TV screens and paintings sure. on the wall, stuff like that. Sure, I'll, yeah, I'll touch base on that on the last one. I'll just run through these uh, finished pictures. So of the model we were just looking at. So you can kind of see um, back in the beginning where we, I was showing five different options of how they wanted to clad this fireplace. Um, this is what we ended up with. So um, that's helpful. But this is the view, like right when you walk in the front door, you can see the ocean. So obviously the glass and um, being able to study, study that in the model um, was helpful. Here's that canted window we were looking at in the dining room. So you can see how that you know, turned out in real life. Some of the tile options that this ended up just being glass painted on the backside instead of tile. Um, master bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, outside the fountain. So you can kind of see they ended up not doing the mitered window here for cost savings, but I think we did one here. Um, and there's the back of that. So the back nice had a shot. lot of land, the back had a lot of landscaping. Can you just go back um, to where we see more of the whole backyard? Sure. Yeah. Um, did you in design, the... did you design the landscaping and uh, and if so did you render it because none of your images showed landscaping really. So there's a uh, twofold on that. Um, there was a bluff setback and we were not allowed to show any like permanent um, fixtures, I guess, in, in the plan. Obviously all of this stuff, paving and whatever is somewhat temporary and could come out if required. Um, but so we had to, we could only show a certain amount um, from a permitting standpoint. And so we modeled some, but this, this outside plan um, changed kind of over over the process of finishing the house, and so it wasn't represented in the model because it changed. We okay. kind of stopped kind of right, were, you know, were, right at this there. So you were designing it, and uh, but it, it w couldn't be in the drawings because of the those limitations of permit. Correct. Yeah, so we just kind of stopped here. Um, our bluff setback it follows all this kind of permanent um, stuff, the stairs and and uh, the pool, hot tub and pool area. So that kind of ended that. Um, okay. Okay, very good. There's that. And then next project is back in 21. Um, this is the kind of contemporary... I want to say this is I, I just love you know, the variety of these styles and the beautiful work and I'd like if, if some of you who are watching just if you have similar feelings to share you know what what do you think about the architecture aside from the um, uh, you know the Archicad stuff that <laughs> yeah um, I'm going to go ahead and this um, site is kind of large so I'm going to go ahead and turn it off but I wanted you to just kind of see it initially in in context, um, see mesh train, we'll turn that off. Um, anyway, so this was um, a project that Eric and I were talking about from a, I think you asked about board and batten and standing seam and custom doors, um, furniture, lighting, all of these things. So we actually, um, this style of architecture seems to be pretty popular right now. Um, and we have come up with a solution, maybe not the best, but it's working for us so far. 
um, to do this board mountain siding. Um, so I'll start with that. We, we've gotten better uh, in our office using like the composite walls and modeling as much as we can three dimensionally to, you know, be efficient and limit 2D work. So in this case, See if I can go to the plan. Um, these walls are our composite walls, but we ended up, um, what is this one called? Heidi Wall Exterior. Let's see. I'll just show you this really quick so you can kind of see what we did. Um, two by six board and bat base. Okay, so. We modeled this two by framing, interior gypsum, exterior plywood, and then we just didn't add the skin for the finish um, so that we could model, and I'll turn that on. I think we have it on an A wall finish layer, which is, it says it's on, but I don't see it. Maybe. A wall accessories, let's try that. There it is. Okay, so we modeled this board and batten using kind of what did I what did you call it, Eric? Is it a polygon wall? It's a polygon wall, yeah. So if you okay. when you select it, you can't change it once it's done because it is a polygon wall, but just show when you have no wall selected where that choice is. So you go to the wall tool with nothing selected. Oh, okay. And then you'll see the geometry. The four geometry options, it's that last one. And you can only do it yeah. if you've got it. You can't have it a composite. You'd have to switch to a basic one. So just switch. Right. No, no, no. Oh, the next one. Yeah. Uh, uh, there you go. I'm with you. I'm with you. There we go. So that yeah, way. Yeah, so then you can then you can draw this. You know, we've been drawing these like it's like one inch by, you know, whatever. Anyway, so we've we've modeled this, this whole thing. Um, you know, using that. So we basically did one long one, the longest length that we would need, and then copy it around and trim it. So in the model, this is all showing up, but if I moved this away, um, you would just see the plywood if it didn't have the finish turned on. Um, the thing that's nice about um, Doing it as a as some type of wall is that we're able to just insert. So again, here's a here's a situation where we did the double um, double opening, I guess. So in the main composite wall is where the window is, and in this polygon wall, we have just a window opening so that you can cut out. Um, here, I'll move this out so you can see it. Um, feet or whatever. You can see that we've added in this window opening inside the wall. In the past, before we knew how to do this, we were modeling each of these battens with like the beam tool and then you have to like cut them and move them and it was obviously very cumbersome and a lot of room for error. So we've improved um, from that aspect, but I think Eric said he could show me how to make this a wall that we could extrude. Is that true? Um. No, I think I think what you've done is probably about as efficient as I can imagine. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, I mean you you create you took it's a little bit tedious to create all the boards, um, uh, all, all the, the the verticals uh, like you did, but the uh, um, once you've got it and you can just copy it around, uh, it seems very efficient. And Archicad really, while it has a little bit more work to do, it's not very complicated. You know, it's just a simple sure. extrusion of a particular polygon. So you're not yeah. weighing down the model. Um, and uh, yeah, when you cut holes for the windows, most cases that's going to work for something thin like this, um, that you can just make the window punch out far enough um, from right. the, native, the native wall. So. Yeah, and then again, it's a few more steps because you have to, you know, trim this wall and the other wall, but um, it's, it's all very, um, doable so that that's how we came up are those supposed to be yellow or is that just the yellow uh, pen that's going on the um on that so part of part of a, a quirk of eisman design because um 
because I came from AutoCAD and I like to work in a black background, um, we have, um, we don't use many of, of the ARCHICAD pens because I know what these colors are, like how thick they are. So we have created our own pens and I know that this is the thinnest up to the thickest. So if you work in a black background, you see the color. And if you work in a white background, you use these black ones in our office so that you know that this is very thin up to very thick. And so it's yellow because of the, the ID pen, our Eisman design pen that we use. So Otherwise it would be brown or uh, blue or whatever. Um, okay. So, you know, whatever what I, Archicad uses. When this came up in the training class yesterday, I looked at it. And it's actually controlled by your override. So if you go to your graphic override pop-up in the bottom right presentation, not that one, the next one over, press down on that. If you do no overrides, you're going to see something different. Because that, that particular one you drew with the red pen. But let's go back to that, that override. Um, it's a, the, pre the presentation solid, which is the one you had. Um, mm -hmm. And then just open up the settings for the presentation because this is this is a nice little tech tr trick that we can do. So go under, uh, um, click on the little icon next to the presentation. You know, it's the it'll open up the dialog box. Okay, so now in our key at 20 and above, we have graphic overrides. In this one, say, hey, we're going to have a simplified view of all the presentation elements. So it says cut fills solid black. So click on cut fill solid black and then uh, click on little edit rule. So this right now, right now is saying that if it's a wall window or if it's a wall rather than a window or door, change the line type to pen 244. When you have this override, change that 244 to uh, you know the brown or whatever color would be useful. And then say okay. There you go. So the the um, this this presentation solid and the graphic overrides changed our world because my boss is very particular about how he wants to see schematic design, and a big portion of us hand drawing versus working in the computer was because with the the composite walls you had to see um, either core only or you would see all these lines, all the layers of the, um, the, the sheathing and the drywall and the framing core and all the pieces to get the full thickness of the finished wall. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to see all of that. He only wanted to see it all smooth, but we wanted to place toilets and cabinetry and furniture and whatever in the appropriate space away from the wall, but which you can't do if your drywall's not turned on. This graphic override allowed us to make our schematic design floor plan um, read. So this is the full entire model. You can see down here, entire model. So this includes finishes on both sides, but it allowed us to show. Um, so turn off the graphic override temporarily, where it says presentation solid, change that to no overrides. And now. So instead of seeing drywall framing drywall, we were able to um, make it all great. And the other thing that was not available before was when this override first came out, it only could be 100% black and he did not like the look of that. So he really wanted it to be gray and a 40% or something lighter. And so now we have the ability to change that. So this was a huge add for us in the office to minimize work. So we're going to do one more thing, um, Leslie, if you don't mind. But open sure. up the presentation solid because right now the presentation solid is making those brown. They don't stand out. So we're going to do the cut fill solid black and um, just put it back to the 244. Um, and now go back in. So now this is what you're used to seeing on the plan, right? Now what mm -hmm. we're going to do is yeah. create a new graphic override that's presentation solid brown or something like that. We're just going to so click on that. And now we're going to say new on the bottom left. And uh, it's a duplicate combination. And just, you know, presentation solid one is fine, or you can give it a, you know, a different name. Now where it says cut fill solid black, press down on that. 
and we're going to open it <clears throat> and we're going to duplicate that rule. So the rule is highlighted on the left side, cut fill solid black. So on the bottom where it says new, click on that and then do a duplicate. And then, you know, you can name it something or you can just do the solid black one, say, okay. And this one, we're going to change the 244, you know, the yellow pen okay. to that brown. Okay, so now we've defined a new rule as an alternate. Click OK. So now what we want to do is the, the what, 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 no, okay, so you went out be, just before we we're done. So go back in. So the new variation, presentation solid one, we want to change the cut fill solid black rule. You press down on cut fill solid black on the right side. And um, actually, I'm sorry, uh, cancel that because we want to do. We want to substitute, press down on, on it, and I think you can choose which one it is, um, or right click on it. Um, okay, I guess what we're doing, we'll, we'll remove, we'll do the remove and we'll put in the new variation. So remove in the bottom right. And then we're going okay. to- Oh, you want to um, add. You want to add, add the, the solid black one and then after. remove. That's right, remove that. Okay. So now we have two variations that are, the same except for the outline. So now just say OK. So now if you go to the presentation solid, the one that was, so the pop up there, just choose the original one. Now you've got your plan the way you want it. And let's go back to 3D. And just cha change the definition of the DD model. So where you see a DD model in the view map settings. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to change to say whenever we're in 3D for this, and you might want to do it for all of them, then you're going to use a different presentation override. And now in 3D, we have the uh, brown natural, you know, more, more appropriate look. Whereas on plan, we've got the yellow, the bright yellow that uh, works best on the, on the, uh, we could just change this to um, all black or black and gray, and it would um, take the color away completely, I think. Let me see. Maybe not. Maybe change to black, all black. There we go. Okay. So we can do that, too, so that the, like, if it's distracting to get rid of the color. Okay. Um, so, so I think yeah. what I want to just make sure everybody knows is that <clears throat> you're always going to manipulate your um, settings to give the best result using Archeads tools, ideally, like it's no problem to have another variation of a graphic override. You saw how easy that was. So don't feel like if, if Archeads isn't doing something the way you want it, don't feel like you're stuck. You know, in most cases, you can make a, a, a tweak. And if, if you get you get stuck, just ask me, you know, I'll, I'll help you to figure that out. So. Um, let's see, it's not, I was going to go back to, oh, it won't matter because I over, I did this. I was just going to put this back on so that, because, because everything's black, it's a little bit hard to see, um, on the black and white. Let me turn this uh, stuff off again. Mesh and 3D plants, those really bog really bog you down, but they look nice. Okay, um, then quickly in here. So these, um, these, we did do some custom doors. Um, all right, these ones in here were modeled um, custom door with slab. Um, I don't know if I can come around in here, sorry. I know sometimes um, walking is a little bit easier, but anyway, so those were modeled with um, just slabs uh, over in 2D kind of in plan and you do the file save selection as door leaf um, when you're in there and then you can come in and select the um, custom custom door leaf and then it'll be saved in all of your custom panels. So we just uh, did that, but I used uh, library handles. Um, 
again, this is a model where we did a lot of um, custom furniture, custom light fixtures. I feel like uh, light fixtures are the hardest thing to find in any Archicad or 3D library that are um, appropriate or that work for your model. So this is where I use basic shapes that we talked about earlier and model, model them. Um, looking at, you know, something that the client liked, um, or simply this is just um, a, a common, a common light pendant lamp. Looks like it's from version 16, but I know that it's also available in, in the other, uh, the other versions. And I just applied a JPEG image of this kind of castle uh, material to it. Um, similarly, I believe there's custom picture some, some of this is custom, um, and then like these are also little uh, sconces are custom, and it's just basic cylinder, cylinder pieces, um, and so the ones on the patio are, are, are also good. These kind of um, conoid, what is this called? <laughs> Yeah, the conoid shape um, with different angles. And, you know, there's three of them here. So three different conoid shapes and then um, just mirrored on the axis to create the circle itself. So um, we have we get creative in our office on how to, to view things for our, for our clients. Um, talking, oh, we, this one we wanted to talk about the standing seam metal roof. So again, this is like our basic, um, composite roof piece uh, with a thin uh, layer of sheathing and um, and then a thin kind of finish for the metal. And then we use the roof wizard for our any exposed tails. If I um, group them back, you can see like what's grouped. Um, all these grouped uh, roof wizard. And so that's the same way we actually modeled the standing seam was just by using the roof wizard, but changing the, the spec to be just this tiny thin half inch by one inch tall um, rib that we kind of set on top of our, of our composite roof. Um, and it's, it's been working out great because it keeps it grouped and, um, and it obviously populates very quickly, so we're not like placing all of these. And we can get the shadows we want in the model and in the renderings by having this actually in a 3D form. So <clears throat> I was muted and I've also been responding. There's a ton of technical comments. Um, <laughs> we're pointing out that uh, CAD image coverings, which is a paid product that you can buy through CAD Image, the New Zealand uh, company that was connected uh, as part of the New Zealand distributor of ArchiCAD. Now things may have changed, you know, maybe I'm not quite sure how, where they stand, but they're based in New Zealand. They create some good add-ons for ArchiCAD. And so the coverings will allow you to do things like the board and batten or roof tiles and probably the standing seam as well. Uh, you pay for it you know there's a certain cost per month per license so that's uh something to be aware of and there can be some issues as you move forward from one version of archicad to another although probably in general it's not a not a deal breaker um but people have pointed out that you can do some of those things using those tools um anyway so i've been, been typing away answering questions and things <laughs> so let me just look at um uh Okay, real model architect. The, oh, yeah, let me just, let me just so I, I know there's more for you to share, but I I want to respond to the people who've been. Yeah. Um, there's a real architects has a very useful board and batten tool on their online site, so that's interesting. I'll have to look that up. Um, James Murray on their online, so James Murray and real architects on onland.info. Um, so I'll I'll. Copy down that link. Uh, Richard Morrison just shared that. Um, okay, standing seam roof. So the standing seam roof, uh, just to elaborate on what you said, Leslie. Um, so the roof wizard is a tool that's been around for a long, long time. 
many, many versions of ArcCAD, you select one or more roofs on plan rather than in 3D, and you use the design menu to uh, choose the roof wizard and either do uh, one part of the roof or you can do the whole thing using the roof wizard. It will create framing. So let's say structural framing like rafters and hips, uh, you know, all of the different support of the, the roof but you can tell it to make things thin and small, like you know what the, um, the standing seam representation was. And although it's defined by the roof geometry, in other words, it actually follows the roof shape and you know, complicated hips and things like that are, are done pretty well. After it's done, they're all individual objects that you can move around. So what Leslie is able to do is to, it'll put it inside the roof, um, but you basically, you, you make these, in this case, these standing seam little pieces and just raise them up. Um, you know, mm -hmm. just select them after it and just take them outside the roof volume. But it did create it based on the roof volume. Um, and yes, yeah, so the cap, yeah. Yeah, the ridge cap, similar to the parapet um, in the previous model, it was, I went on to, you know, the manufacturer's website and kind of saw how the shape was and then generated this in the um where did you tell me this was sure, edit select. And select. yeah so i um i kind of put in these lines to kind of represent the slope of my roof and then modeled what this cap was going to look like and then applied it to um to a beam right. now, i'm going to able to that, uh, that I discovered again when I was teaching based on this, because this is where I look and say, hmm, that looks odd. So zoom in on it, you can see a little break in the, um, uh, in the cap, you know, about a foot in, right? Where it's sort of stopping. Mm -hmm. um, you see it's not there in the actual cap. Now put it, just put it back so you can see. What, so what it is, is it's a, um, a material priority issue um, because uh, go ahead and select it again and, and just edit it. No, 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 right, no, you have to right, no, no, you have to right click on it and say edit complex profile. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, now zoom in on it just so everyone can see that that is a fill that is defining a building material, so select it. Now the fill that you've got selected in the top, you can see on the info box, it says 220540, steel framing. So it's not really framing, right? Well, steel mm -hmm. framing is a certain priority. It's strong, but it's not as strong as some things. And if you change that to just metal steel, I think that's what I did. Um, if you go to metal steel in the bottom of the center row, there you go. Um, and then possibly change the override surfaces. So where it says override surfaces on, on the left. And then just make it whatever color you want. All right, so now yeah. it's going to be made out of a, a slightly different building material and it'll be you know, gray unless you override it in context. Now save it. Yeah, I hit apply. Yeah, okay. And then just go back to 3D. You see now it's 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 stronger than something that was on a hidden layer that yeah. was interacting with it. Um, so just yeah, I to think know, it was something to do with the wall. This wall was cutting yeah. it or whatever. So yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. So little little tricks like that that have to, you know understanding building material priorities um, there. Okay, so before we go on, let's see. Um, do you model topo with the mesh tool and a survey with contours? So that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, I mean yes, we use the mesh tool. Um, we bring in the two D uh, DWG from our surveyor. Um, just in our office. Um, we rename all the layers in the survey to say survey so that we that they're grouped when we bring them in um, just kind of a best practices for our office and then um, we bring them in change their pens to be whatever we want them to be so that they look right in our plot and then um, we'll draw the mesh using the mesh tool um, Kind of trace the property line and then magic wand we eyedropper and magic wand the contours to create them and then go back and um, raise them on the z-axis in the mesh command um, 
the more points on the survey topo on the DWG, the larger the mesh is. And so sometimes that uh, bogs our models down because you could redraw them, but it's super time consuming. So we kind of just suffer through it. Uh, so one point in terms of this terrain, so can, can you select the terrain? Let's just see how many contour lines you've got. Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, I'll point this out as a rule that, that'll help you, Leslie, as well as others. So when the surveyor gives you all of those contour lines, you do not repeat, do not have to model every contour line. Near the building, you probably want to be very accurate so that you can show how the land goes. But as you go further away, you could do every second, third, or fifth contour line because all it's doing is giving you context. No one's measuring the exact amount of earth out there, right? So of all those lines that we're seeing there, you could have probably had a quarter as many lines and still gotten just as much useful context. There. So that's one thing. Another is if you magic wand those lines, then you're going to be following every single little um, dip that the abstract mathematical triangulation did. And for the ones that are further away, you can absolutely just trace it manually and have mm -hmm. a tenth as many dots and a hundredth as many po um, surface uh, polygons because it's sort of squared um, there. Uh, so, so this mesh probably has, I'm, I don't know exactly, but let's just say it has a million points. You could get it down to 10,000 points probably. In other words, just by okay. understanding that. So it takes a little longer than just magic wanding each one of those things, but it is so much uh, more, you know, makes it so much easier for ARCHICAD to handle. That's that's a great tip. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Um, um, okay. Well, um, if there's nothing, is there anything else on this? Then I or we can um, answer well, questions we, while there is the a, a point that someone made about turning off contour lines. So just zoom in a little bit on the house, if you would. And, you know, so we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, all these edge lines, which does make a nice crisp effect. But if you wanted to have a little bit of a softer effect and avoid maybe the yellow lines and those sort of things, because there even there still are yellow lines around the windows, for example, um, you know, around, around the at least the um, uh, casing or the, you know, the, the trim around the windows. So you can go to the view menu. Not, not view settings, no, view menu. And you can go to 3D view options. And then you can see the 3D styles there. There are different ones that you can do. Uh, so if you just open up 3D styles, this will allow you to edit the view type. And one of the options is to turn off contour, show contours. You can turn that off. It's a checkbox. Now, right now, this is going to modify the definition of simple shading, and you can always turn it back on. But uh, just do that, and you'll see a different feeling. Um, now, here we're really not seeing the board and batten. Why? If you zoom in on it, you will see it, but we're not seeing any reveal from it because it's the same color, right? Where um, mm -hmm. uh, the the wall is made like that little in and out pattern is all the same gray. So we don't see that level of detail there. So in this case, we would lose a lot of the clarity of the view. Yes, they're still there. You can sort of see it just <laughs> bit there. Uh, but now turn it back on, just to go back to the view menu, 3D view options. So, you know, I wanted it, someone was repeatedly saying, couldn't you do that? Couldn't you do that? And the answer is yes. And there are trade-offs. So it's going to take a second for it to rethink about it. And this is be partly because they were um, the uh, you have the mesh turned on with so much detail. Yeah. All right. Um, OK, so a lot of comments here. Um, uh, uh, OK, what creates the lines in the custom sliding door? 
So we are gonna, <clears throat> because we could take a lot of these questions in detail and, and end up using the rest of the time, let's look at some of your rendering uh, things and and as part of that, show where your, your library of furniture, where you get it, and your library of those um, paintings and uh, TV screens, because um, okay. I thought that was so cool, you know. So in our, on our server, we have our template. We have um, extra folders that we've created, the, these, all of these actually, um, and they're linked to our, our template here. So in ID Textures, we have art, brick, floors, TV images. So um, we'll save images in here and that way we can, everyone in the office has access to them and you just, um, so, and fireplaces too. So I'll show you, um, we have a lot of like sports fanatics and, um, and things. So if you come into here and you use your TV object, you can say picture on screen or you can say use custom picture. And if you use custom picture, all you have to do is know the name of this. So we'll use this 49ers one. So I can just, as long as I type it in exactly how it's named in, in this TV image, um, it will show up um, on, on the TV screen. So we just save JPEG images and, um, and do things like that. Um, let's see, these objects, so in here, because we're, a lot of the times our clients want very specific, um, you know, tile, as um, you can imagine, this stuff that you've seen inside this model in particular, there's something like this in the laundry room, there's some penny tile in some of the showers, there was like a black and white um, hexagon in the, in the, um, master bathroom. Um, this is in some of the other bedrooms. So the, an interior designer provided these finishes for me. And in order for me to get them in the model, we need to have a JPEG of them. But instead of having it be specific to only this project, we put it into like our community server texture so that once it's in there, everybody can use it. And if they copy this finish floor, floor slab from my model into their model, it automatically like links the material and it makes it, um, and it's done correctly. And that's also part of the twin motion materials and things like that, getting them to show up and having them be in one place versus, um, you know, job specific, I guess. So um, we have a lot of things in here. And then similarly, um, miscellaneous objects. We like to accessorize quite a bit um, with wine bottles and um, books and art and things that make it, you know, look livable. Um, I actually modeled some horizontal wine bottles out of, again, the basic shapes. I, they're not inside this model, but I've done like wall mounted wine racks uh, that I modeled um, just with basic shapes, but, um, Anyway, we like to make it look homey and lived in. Uh, we also use those textures for rugs. That's a big one. Um, I think it's under textiles. Um, you might want to do like an area rug and it's a specific area rug or whatever. So we've picked out, you know, different rugs. Here's that image of the light fixture I use, black fringe, super random. Um, pillows, so fabric for pillows. Uh, this is for the blanket on the beds. So we just utilize these images to apply to our objects um, uh, that we're, you know, overriding. And a lot of these we've downloaded from, uh, like, I forget the 3D bin, not like the one that's connected to Archicad, but another, like, another one. Um, Anyway, so there's that 3D warehouse um, <clears throat> is one. BIM components is another. Yeah, BIM components, I think, is the one I'm thinking of. And now, uh, well, in the last two or three years, we now have the ability to bring in Revit objects directly using a free plugin. 
Um, so and SketchUp, uh, we do a lot of SketchUp. My coworker is like she um, converts them or bring you know brings them in from SketchUp because SketchUp has a lot more options, I guess, or they've there maybe more people have access to SketchUp and have made models, and then we can so there's a larger library to choose from, and then we can bring those in into our model. Mm -hmm. Um, now, there's a question here related to all of us. Where are you finding some of the good, these good seamless images? Um, so, um, I am a big fan of Google Image. <laughs> um, I try to type in um, kind of simple description in Google Image and find something that's flat. Occasionally, um, we might take it into Photoshop and um, mirror it around you know in the um you know when you're making your surfaces this these options um a lot of the times we'll you know we'll choose this option so when you go to two by two it is folding it or mirroring it on all the um, areas so it looks like a larger seamless image however we have learned in twin motion it automatically defaults to this regardless of what your ARCHICAD model is set to. So we've had to come back and in Photoshop maybe create a larger version of that texture to um, to reapply. So something okay. to keep in mind. So uh, let me just make a general technical note. <clears throat> so you can take any picture and potentially put it in Photoshop and manipulate it to get a seamless texture. Some things are going to be pretty straightforward. Others are going to take a lot of work. So you have to, you know, figure that um, out. What's if you can find something that's already seamless? That's great. There are a lot of places online that make those available. Um, and if you did want to just create your own, uh, I periodically will Google something like how to create a seamless texture. You know, and you'll find people have done whole videos. Uh, on doing that. So, of course, once you have that skill, and I have a basic level of skill on it, I can do that when I need to. Um, but yeah, if you can find one that's already good. Now, one of the things that you showed very, not very early on, but uh, I think in your AIA presentation that we saw at the very beginning was uh, you showed like a fireplace in context, and then you showed a little uh, you know, a larger scale image of maybe from the manufacturer of just that particular design inspiration. Yeah. yeah. And so um, that's an interesting way. So you can get something that may not be quite perfect in the context, but it's pretty good. And then you have the really clear, crisp, you know, manufacturer's image um, there. But let's see um, some of your high end renderings that you've got in. Yeah. In so now that Twin Motion is. Um, well, here, I'll show you the quick uh, Lumion. Um, we did this. This was done in Lumion for this project. Um, I personally did not do it, so I can't tell you, but I can show you the, um, this, the end result of bringing this into Lumion um, with the lights. And it's, you know, just a soft image. Um, and then now that uh, Twin Motion is in here. You just click direct link, and I already have it open, so I can show you what that looks like. Um, I apologize for any um, nausea I may cause you as I as I roll through this video because I'm not um, still kind of like learning how to navigate it, um, but. So, um, you know, the trees are on, it's windy, there's smoke coming out the chimney, um, the lights are on, and you can kind of, um, this, is, this is what we would show to a client, not the like raw manipulation of twin motion. Um, that's like a whole nother kind of lunch and learn or whatever. Um, but you can see how we've been able to apply light to the fixtures in our model and um, fire. The fire is always really aggressive, so <laughs> it's a little hard to place. But um, but you can just see obviously a big difference between um, 
just the level of finish. Oh, here, look on the couches. This is what I was talking about, how it tiles the, the finish. It automatically puts it back to that, the one by one. Um, and we would probably go back and edit that to make it a little bit smoother. But um, I don't know, you can kind of just see the reflectivity on the glass and how much, um, you know, kind of just more real and warm that this that this looks compared to your typical uh, BIMX. So, so, and it's fairly easy to update. So you are moving through this live, right? Um, and so, we're seeing and, and we're seeing it just relayed through go to webinar, so it's a little bit more bumpy than it would be in your, um, uh, you know, on your screen. Uh, but overall, it's amazing how soft and natural it is compared to what we're used to. Um, and of course, for uh, for clients, you know, this is going to be much more satisfying. It just feels rich and and uh, well certainly more realistic. Now, just for yeah. clarity, the Twin Motion is a uh, tool developed by a game maker, I forget uh, what the, they're called. Epic, Epic uh, yeah. Games. Yeah, Epic Games. And uh, so we have a direct connection from ArchiCAD. You can export out of ArchiCAD 22 or 23 into Twin Motion. It is the model. Of course, you, you can see that it's the same one we were looking at. Um, and there are ways to update it. So like you, you're gonna do some things like add trees and add some other things that aren't in the ARCHICAD model. You'll put in their trees that can blow in the wind. Um, right. But then if your roof pitch changes or you've changed the layout of the house or whatever, you can update and basically whatever is in the ARCHICAD model will just update uh, naturally. So it's a really yeah. um, you know, pretty slick connected interface. The other, um, that's all, yeah, it's all true. And it's all pretty user friendly. Um, I've been able to, you know, you, you select, it's, it's usually good to change um, glass and wood and any, any type of surface that might have some reflectivity to update that once you get into Twin Motion. Um, there's materials in there and you kind of just drag and drop them. So as long as, all of your um, glass, let's say, is clear, uh, clear fast or whatever it is in your ARCHICAD model, it'll update all of it at once. If you drag it, you know, when you're in the manipulated um, twin motion file, where you're actually making edits to it, um, it updates everything um, pretty seamlessly. You can pick backgrounds and you add fire and you add these plants and you can you almost paint them, right? You select the density of and the size of your brush and kind of click and run it around over here on your on the ground, or you can click one by one and place and place the plants. Um, and it's it's pretty user friendly. I would definitely um, encourage everyone to kind of just play around with it if your computer can handle it. And then mm -hmm. also out of out of here. Um, I guess we could just um, show this little video while you, we wrap up any questions. So my coworker made a fly through of this for a for a um, job fair uh, home show that we were at. Um, we had a few of them kind of just running so that people, potential new clients, could kind of just stop and look. So. This is, it's like a three, three or four minute video. So if you want to just continue answering questions or talking about stuff while this plays, um, this is my last, the last thing I have. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I've been, of course, splitting my focus a little bit answering questions. So uh, we were just looking at uh, twin motion. Um, is, is this in twin motion or is this in? Um, this is twin, twin motion. In motion and you had mentioned Lumion at one point. Do you, are you still using Lumion for some things? We use it for that rendering that I showed. Um, I I'm not all sure about you know what the you know what kind of graphics and other things, but this this rendering was created out of Twin Motion, taking taking a BIMX model into Twin Motion and like changing some of the 
the colors and adding the lights and the and the foreground and stuff i believe um was done in lumion so i don't know exactly how but this rendering was was came out of lumion okay so you're using lumion for some of your sort of high-end um visualization yeah it's not it's not um the twin motion i think is gonna be our our new norm Mm -hmm. compared to the the um the bimx and then we may throw lumion in for specific specific things but for now i think twin motion is going to be um our next level right right no it's fantastic with what you've done there um so yeah there are a bunch of questions here um so is the webinar going to be available for later viewing yes it's being recorded and will be uh, posted on my YouTube channel as well as the ArchiCAD user website. Um, so uh, sketchuptextureclub.com has lots of free high definition architectural textures. Ah, that's interesting. I'm gonna um, just copy that link and put it in here. Um, so thank you, John Dunham. Um, so Federico says, I'm doing the exterior vertical elements with curtain walls, so I have a parametrical facade. So that's an interesting thing. So, you know, you, you could do the Batten's um, uh, system where you might change the frequency of it or the sizes and see what it looks like. So with the curtain wall, if you select it, you can change, you know, the, the grid pattern. Um, so that's an interesting one. Um, Okay, 3dtextures.me is a nice site with free textures. Um, let me just uh, paste that in. I'm going to just reply back to these um, people with a dot. Uh, so what that'll do is it'll show up. If all of you who are watching live right now, uh, you will see it as a comment that comes through. So let me just see this another one um, on land uh, here. So the on land baton tool so chris uh, illip uh did uh so micah asks how do you handle roof textures such as shingles do you break the roof into multiple roofs for control of individual planes to be able to control uv mapping there's no option to paint individual faces of roofs yeah um we haven't gotten into that for shingle roofs we usually have a um a composite component that's you know a few inches thick for like a um, a Spanish tile or a concrete tile. So there's an image applied, and then we'll use the um, the tile ridge object and put those over the hips and the ridges to kind of just and sometimes along the the eave just in a single level to kind of give it some more um, depth. But um, yeah, we're not not getting into that level of detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so Saxon mentions I found using twin motion for a two D elevation render is not a great resolution image. So um, do you have any tips for resolution? Um, obviously, on screen sharing things look great. Um, maybe for putting it, you know, on a poster um for 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 twin motion so this is what we're talking about um so that's it i'm i'm not understanding the question i guess um so saxon asks i have found twin motion for a 2d elevation render is not a great resolution image so if okay. you're doing a flat elevation and you want to have it rendered um have you been using that or or not um no not that i know so maybe maybe the lumion one is better or like um we use photoshop in in-house we use indesign um it just depends on like how large of a format you need but well um the photo we we do use this like right out of here the um the cine render or the mm -hmm. Some of that I'm trying to, I don't, um, we've used some of the rendering stuff that's built into here as a base, and then we'll bring it into Photoshop to do some work, or um, maybe, maybe Lumion is going to be where we go for that, but we're not, 
we're not producing anything lar much larger than like a 24 by 30, you know, 36, 30 by 42, something like that for um, for the renderings. And, and it's usually not on the, not for like a billboard or a poster board. It's very, it's very much like local architectural review committee or, um, you know, client graphics or something that's, that's not on that large of a scale. So I might not be the best resource for that. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's see. Dean Johnson says, "How do you model? Uh, how did you model the wire deck railing?" We did use the railing, the railing object tool that is uh, challenging. <laughs> um, this is a big learning curve for us. Uh, some people in the office are better at it than others. So I think I grabbed this from another project that had it kind of dialed in and then um, was able to to manipulate the I basically made it very simple and then just did the post sorry say is, that again is it in panels on the left side of that dialogue no no, no on the, uh, in the dialogue panels there you go oh actually no no what it is you know you've got actually rails so go to rails yeah and click on one of the horizontals. And if you click on any one of them, you'll see that it's a very tiny rail, round, eighth inch by eighth inch. inch. So that's the wire. And there were just a number of them put in at you know, heights that were um, you know, uh, nice and even. And then the balusters, if you click on balusters, you've got, again, balusters that are built-in posts. You can see down near the bottom, it says built-in post. Um, and there are six, um, six inches apart is that right um, it says six feet but i don't oh you know what equally distributed equally distributed yeah yeah and then down below baluster component settings no no no. it's in that same section but down a little lower what is it uh and you go back to from the 3d representation go back a little bit so under baluster component settings and one more there you go there's the eighth inch by eighth inch so basically um it's using balusters for the vertical wires and rails for the horizontal wires, and uh, they're just very thin um, so cylinders, and that creates the wire. So you can then stretch and it. The posts can be any distance apart, whether it's two feet or ten feet or you know several meters. Um, and, and we did might... not use the post um, thing. I basically just left it simple like that, and then added in two D added a node along the um along here so everywhere that i've added a node so like if i um let's see if i added a node along here i don't know why it's not letting me do that there then it would it would add a new a new um post so I just made it kind of simple and then went along and added so you didn't have any, along here to create those posts. You didn't have any interior posts where it would put it at an even spacing. You just defined the post by creating extra node points, which basically said, here's a juncture. Correct. Right, perfect. That allowed me to space them and put them where I wanted them versus having to... Um, I'm sure once we, you know, I learn more about it, I can... I'd be able to do it in here, but I didn't. I didn't know how to do that at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Uh, Dan Wyckoff says I did a job site sign at 300 dots per inch, and it was eight feet long. Whoa! That is. You must have had a very high, high resolution. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Now, one thing I'll point out is. Uh, since you don't typically go up to a job site sign or even um, you know any type of large printed poster and look at it like you look at a piece of paper, um, you know it, you don't need to have 300 dots per inch for every part of it. Um, in fact, 100 dots per inch is, is probably more standard resolution for a poster sized image um, because of the way that it smooths things out. Uh, you know, just in terms of the printing process generally it'll work pretty well uh, and if you have something that's in a job site sign you can um, 
you know, you, you could have something like 4,000 pixels across, which might only be 50 dots per inch or something like that. Um, so it is uh, there. Um, okay, another one for textures here. I'm just replying back so that everybody can have access to it. And I'm posting it also in our, um, uh, our Slack workspace for people who are in the course. So that'll be uh, available. Um, okay, and Dan says you can set the output resolution for renders in the export menu of Twin Motion. There we go. Okay, thank you, Dan. So for the whoever it was who said, um, maybe it was Saxon, that when you're doing a render in Twin Motion, you uh, and he was saying it wasn't high enough resolution. You can set that in the export menu of Twin Motion. So there. There's a good point. Um, and I guess he uh, he's the one who said he did a job site sign at 300 DPI and it was eight feet long. So eight okay. feet long, 96 inches, 300. So 96 or 100 times 300 is 30,000 pixels. So yeah, so something. <laughs> um, all right. Um, David Lohmeyer says, how soon is the twin motion flyby used in the design process? So at what point do you start using twin motion? Um, it would be at the end of our design development. So after after our schematic design and massing is kind of approved, then we we move into design development where we're working in um, in 3D and kind of modeling all of these things that you're looking at here. Mm -hmm. So instead of um, Twin Motions going to I think start to take the place of the BIMX model. So where we would normally we'd finish this all out and we would normally save as a BIMX and run the global and do that whole thing, we will probably be um, exporting to Twin Motion at that point. So it would be full and complete um, to this level, and we would just utilize Twin Motion instead of BIMX um, for the higher end projects. I think for the lower end projects, we'll still just use the BIMX, like right. new models and, and additions, but for full customs, we'll be doing the twin motion. Yeah, so if you think about it, um, Archicad's 3D window is, you get used to it as a designer um, to understanding what you've got in there. You don't have to see it in that full naturalistic view to do the, your design. I mean, you could, but every time that you export, you know, there's always going to be some massaging, some time spent there. So, yeah, it makes sense to get most of your design in place before you start focusing on presenting it in this higher level. The other thing to think about is, and this is a classic thing about BIM and 3D architectural software, is if you show a client that you've got a concept and you're working on it, and it's not really that pinned down and you show it to them in too much high resolution, too much too complete a uh, level of detail mm -hmm. in terms of rendering, they may think it's done. They may think, why am I paying you a whole lot more to get, you know, for the rest of this work? Or they may think that they can't change it because it is, it's completed. So showing them sketch mode things, showing them, you know, just black and white images, you know, um, showing that without much entourage. Um, you know, then they understand we're working on spatial arrangements. We're working on, you know, just some overall style and design choices. And, uh, but ultimately being able to show people something that they can really understand, you know, so particularly when you're getting to the interior fit out and the textures of the surfaces, you know, do you want this type of stone or that type of metal or, you know, whatever it is, that's where as well as just sort of being sexy and people going, wow, this is so great. I'm so glad I'm working with you or I want to work with you because you do this. Um, but that's when people can say, I like this more than that. You know, then, right. then they can tell. That's a really good point. And we um, keep that in mind as well. Like this, to your um, point, we're not necessarily showing these hard finished things too early on. Um, by the time the client sees this type of model. Typically, um, we have consultants already signed up and involved and starting to work or we're, or we're getting right at the same time where 
we're going to, you know, kick off structural and kick off civil. And because um, most of the time, the floor plan and the massing is already dialed in. So they're not going to be making like big changes to the structure. It's going to be more finished level. So we're able to get all of those people kicked off and we're working on, you know, towards construction documents and uh, are starting them when they see this like finished finished model and then we can update any detailing or finishes that need to be included in construction documents there's still plenty of time to include those those details in the in the permit set mm -hmm. yeah uh, Roger Schaefer asked how many hours would be in a project like this well that's a great question um, we are getting more and more efficient so I think we um, we allot something like for for a, like say a twin motion model to like develop the model to this level and and do twin motion or whatever. I think our our max allowable hours is like maybe a hundred, but we're probably getting it done in half of that. I would say maybe maybe three quarters of that, depending on the level of detail and how many times we have to do, you know, go back and update something or rework something. So, okay. So your budget, be, budget for the for the work 100 hours, and you're now getting it more routinely done in 70 or 80 hours, um, and that yeah is, include the the design, um, or is that just no for the model? just for the modeling. Okay. Just this, like the deliverable of a of a three D executable file twin motion modeling. Um, okay. I would that, say our schematic our schematic design is um, is probably a uh, hundred and hundred to one hundred and forty hours on a larger home like this, and then um, construction documents are. Again, it would depend on the level of detailing that we're providing. Um, I would say on the previous project that I showed, the really the things like you know five six thousand square feet, and I detailed, I literally detailed the mounting bracket that hung the wall mounted nightstands and the glass floor in the powder room that I didn't show you, but it's really cool. This is like a glass floor, so you're floating. I detailed the framing that holds the glass so that one was you know hundreds of hours of, of conduct and CA time but um, on a typical project I don't know I feel like it's probably a, you know hundred 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 if you break it down into you know each phase and yeah between coordination and and annotating and detailing and whatever it's it was probably you know 100 schematic 100 dd 100 cd i'm totally spitballing here i wasn't quite and, know, the, and, the DD, and the dd side is where you're actually really building out the model in detail yeah 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 right. okay um and are you doing the the schematic design in our keycad i mean i know that bill you're you know the he doesn't even get to use ArchiCAD anymore. <laughs> we don't. We don't let him work in there. Yeah, yes, we do every. We do everything in ArchiCAD. Yeah, I mean, we might start out um, sketching some like bubble diagrams and and maybe you know kind of laying out a few things in on paper. But for the most part, we're um, a reasonably young staff, so everybody's kind of computer oriented and they want to just get jump into to archicad and start schematic design right in archicad so yeah we use it for the whole thing and it's it's awesome so um this is uh so jalat says you were doing 2d details to, so do you use linked or unlinked detail markers um although all of our uh, all all of our details are are 2D, I do use, I do link them to the sheet. So if I've got all these details that we've generated here, um, like say this fire pit, for example, is custom for this project. 
um, in my section, maybe, maybe that's not a good one to start with, but, or like the roof, um, even though this thing is kind of generated in a 2D format, once it's placed on the sheet, I'm able to, I link it in the section. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, so my uh, little, yeah. Now, uh, there's a question here. You can choose whether to answer it or not. Uh, now that you've given that, you know, it's roughly 300 hours, um, you know, divided roughly <laughs> equal schematic design and, and construction phases. And one person says, not all customers can afford this. And of course, well, you have some big projects and they're, you know, high end. Uh, but one person asks, what, what are your, what sort of fees do you, what does it say? Um, uh, where was the, I don't know. So what, what sort of fees or what, what kind of fee do you get for a custom house? Um, so sure. um, to what extent you can, you want to share that with us? Um, I will say that, um, I've been working here for, with my boss for 20 years and a lot of them at this company and he is uh, very fair. And I think that we provide a good quality level of work. So our fee structure is kind of broken out. Um, schematic design is hourly with an estimate of hours, depending on the scope of work. So if a, a remodel will say it's going to be an estimated, you know, 20 hours and a custom home might be an estimate of, you know, 100 hours or 60 hours. It'll, we, we adjust each proposal per client scope of work. The design development model that we're showing um, is we typically have it set as a fixed fee, but um, it's not all required. If there's a customer who doesn't want it, doesn't need it, isn't interested, we will um, modify that fee to a minimum amount that we feel we need to develop the model to get it ready for consultants. So it'll be a much abbreviated version of that. So it really depends on the client's need and we obviously want to work with our clients. And so, um, I, I would say that the design development is the biggest um, kind of negotiating that that we have to do. Um, our construction documents are a, are a, um, a cost per square foot for conditioned space and, and a lower cost for unconditioned space. So again, that's a fixed fee. And then we have hourly tasks that are open-ended for uh, consultant coordination and permit application and processing and maybe um, ARC or DRC presentation and approvals because you just never know what those are going to be. But um, our fees are right in range with with our competitors in our area, and um, yeah. So okay, that's, so, I think that's what I'm comfortable sharing. Yeah. Um, so I imagine you're providing a much higher level of service. I mean, just from what we're seeing here, and everybody's been raving about you know, both the architecture and the the Archicad use and the way that this whole presentation has laid out. So I wanna really thank you. We are at the two hour mark, so we'll we'll finish up. Um, but uh, like one of my favorite old longtime clients, Ken Andrews based in Georgia, uh, who's been involved in a lot of this stuff over the years, he said, this is one of the very best presentations ever. So um, you, you've done thank a great- Thank you very uh, much for sharing that. Yeah, so uh, well done, well done. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's it's clear that your clients are getting a tremendous value. Um, and if you do have a range where, you know, it can be sort of up to a certain level of detail or you can take it further, you know, the ones who can afford it will will want it. Um, you know, when you show them, uh, the, you know, here's what we can do for this price, here's what we can do for a different price. And, uh, you know, they're, they're yeah, we, we usually, um, um, I do know that we are not the, the, um, the most expensive in our area either. We're not the mm -hmm. cheapest, but we're not the most expensive. And we do um, almost always meet with our clients ahead of time and show them kind of what I've shown you, like a sample of 
of a project that says this is the deliverable for schematic design, this is the deliverable for design development, this is the deliverable for construction documents, so that they understand when they get a proposal from us what they're getting ahead of time, and then they can um, give some feedback up front to say, you know, I really don't need that. Um, if we could, you know, cut that back or um, whatever, we're obviously willing to work with people and want and want to have those relationships. So. Mm -hmm. By the way, in addition to just general kudos and thanks, uh, Diane Wengross says, thank you for being a great role model for women in the industry. Thank so. you, I'm smiling over here. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so there are other questions that have come in, maybe just two more questions. Do you always get the fees right? And do you include CA automatically for projects? Um, most of the time we get the fees right. Uh, the, the schematic design is an estimate. So occasionally if there's a lot of redesign, um, that will go over our estimate. Uh, but for the other two major tasks, DD and CD, we're able to complete the project um, in the estimated uh, cost or time that we we guess. Um, CA is not automatically included. It is in our contract if um, so that they know that it's an hourly task as needed and that we're here for them. We, we love to be involved in CA. We prefer it. Uh, some clients don't want to pay for it and some contractors frankly don't want to talk to us after that. Like they're they take on the role of architect when they're building and they don't want our, our input. But um, lots of them do. We have a, a bunch of contractors we work with on a regular basis that um, stress the importance of our involvement in construction to the clients. And those are fantastic um, people to work with because they respect um, our field and what we're bringing to the table as architects that you hired us for a reason, so let us continue to make your project great, even during construction, and collaborate with the contractor and with the homeowner um, during the finishes if problems come up or whatever. So we try to be involved, but it's not always um, <laughs> not always an option. Okay, um, I, I can't resist asking one more or passing along one more technical question that you can just answer in you know, 60 seconds or whatever. Um, how do you arrange your office detail library to enable you to easily find the details? Are they in your template or on a server? They're in the template. I'm a huge template person. <laughs> um, so we have, um, in the template, there's probably, for I'll just do a quick example, in the roof, um, say the roof details in the valley, there might be um, in here, we'll have three different kinds. So this one is maybe a composite roof. This one is a, a clay tile roof, mission, mission style roof. And this one is standing seam. And these are all in every template. And so you just kind of adjust your view window on the sheet to the one that applies to your project because these are the three most common ones in our office. And then if you need to edit it, you can, but that's um, how we've kind of got most of them um, set up because they're all 2D uh, as a workaround. So we try to have this detail library in the template, the stuff that we need every time, roof details, stair details, exterior and interior, gutter details, door and window details, um, and maybe like a handful of others, and then we add as needed for project specific. Awesome, awesome. That is that is great to see. And that glimpse, I'm glad I asked that question because that's a real eye opener to say, you know, I just have several variations that, you know, cover, you know, a large percent of your, of your projects and they're there, ready to go. And uh, they're independent, they're a copy of the template file so you can modify them to suit the context, but you know, you're way ahead uh, um, and you don't have to, you know where they are. So that's great. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, warm regards to all from New Zealand. Excellent presentation, very helpful. Lots of very helpful, excellent presentation. I would like to need about two more hours to finish reviewing a lot of the stuff. You'll have to yield <laughs> um, Yeah, thanks both. Um, very 
well done, complete presentation verbally and on screen images, great presentation. And how big is a typical file size? Last question. Oh God, that's the worst. Um, our files are large. Um, that is, let me see here. Um, that is a really great question because our files are big. Let me just pop over here on the side. Um, anywhere from, let's look at the, the contemporary one is 378 megs. And then we probably have some as large as a, over a gig. Okay, so in the hundreds it, to possibly yeah. a full gig worth. Um, so so there, we run into other complications because of that. But. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, Leslie, thank you so much. That was great. Um, it looks like it's been recorded. I mean, I haven't seen any mention of a problem, so we should be able to post the recording um, up, uh, you know, usually within the next day to two days, uh, I'll get it up. I want to wish you all safe, safety and health in these yeah. challenging times. I will, as I said at the very beginning, be trying to focus um, on creating uh, some opportunities for more Archicad users to work on skills to get this type of a, a level of mastery um, that Leslie has, um, because I think that we can use the, this time constructively. Um, and I certainly, today's session was a great use of that. We had, um, you know, over 200 people on the, on the call. Um, so Leslie, your, your work is, and Bill's work is being seen by a lot of users yeah. and we are very thankful. Yeah, we have a great staff and we try to have, try to have fun here, so. Yeah, thank you for everyone's time and, um, and the nice comments that Eric shared with me. It's really, um, I don't do these very often. And um, yeah, sometimes it can be intimidating, but I felt very comfortable and um, I'm glad that it was helpful to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. All right, take care, Leslie. Take care, everybody. Take I'll care. be back next month with more, but I'll be in touch by email with everybody. Take care. And if you're on the Archicad coaching program, I'm going to take a couple of minute break, then we'll start that. So that's where I help Archicad users actually on screen answering questions. Um, so I'll be back shortly. Take care.